Welcome to the presentation on aluminum brazing. Uh, this topic has really become increasingly popular as manufacturers have begun and have completely shifted from using copper to aluminum in HVAC units. So our discussion this evening is going to include a brief overview of Harris. So we'll talk a little bit about Harris, kind of our product offering, and then we'll get into the why of aluminum brazing and then also the how. I do have some videos that are included in this, so I think that'll be really helpful for you as you look at aluminum brazing. You're going to see that compared to copper, this is a very, very fast process, and that's really the emphasis that I'd like to have here this evening. So as Lori said, I am the, the national sales manager here for wholesale. Um, that picture of me is probably a few years old, so I probably have a little more gray hair and maybe a few less hairs on top too. Having three boys at home uh, it tends to do that to you. But nonetheless, uh, uh, I've been here at Harris again for two years. You know, I am based in our Mason, Ohio uh, world headquarters. And again, at the end of this presentation, there'll be an opportunity not only for you to ask questions, but you'll have my contact information as well if you would choose to, uh, to reach out to me. So just a little bit about Harris. I know sometimes in the market, people see Harris, they see Lincoln Electric, and they try to put all this together. So Harris is owned by Lincoln Electric in Cleveland. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Lincoln, uh, they're a global manufacturer of welding products, arc welding equipment, welding consumables, plasma, oxy-fuel cutting equipment, and robotic welding systems. So when Lincoln began to have acquisitions and, uh, and acquire different companies, acquiring Harris Calorific, which was a manufacturer of gas welding and cutting apparatus in 1990, located in Gainesville, Georgia, and in 2005, purchasing JW Harris here in Mason, which manufactured brazing and soldering consumables, it was really a good match and a good blend for Harris and our extension into the HVACR space, but it was also a good extension for Lincoln because if you think about what we do here at Harris, we're joining materials, and in a way, welding is also joining materials. So it really is a very, very good marriage. So we've been that, uh, that company then since 2006, the Harris Products Group, which many of you know today. So we have five manufacturing locations, and I mentioned Mason, Ohio is our headquarters. Here in Mason, we make all of our brazing alloys and aluminum. And then also we make aluminum products here for the OEM channel. So if you're thinking of bends and uh, returns and so on, we manufacture that here in Mason. And I certainly would invite any of you, if you're going to be, Mason, by the way, is a suburb of Cincinnati. So we're about 25 miles uh, north of downtown Cincinnati. If you're ever in the area and you'd like to have a plant tour and see how some brazen alloy is made, uh, we'd love to have you here and be able to, uh, to entertain you. Winston-Salem, we are manufacturing solder. So most of that is consumed in the, uh, the plumbing space. Several years ago, we actually acquired the soldering business from Worthington. Um, you may be familiar with Worthington Cylinders, but we, uh, we bought all of that solder business and we moved all of our soldering manufacturing to Winston-Salem. Uh, all of our regulators and equipment are made in Gainesville, Georgia. And then we have a couple of locations to serve our global markets, which include Poland and Brazil. And not noted on this, we just made a recent acquisition within the past 30 days of a manufacturing facility in Portugal. So we continue to grow and uh, excited to have the, the Portugal team on board now. So in spite of some challenges in 2020, which I know all we've, you know, is I can, we could probably go on for hours about what, uh, what happened in 2020. And, with the global pandemic. But nonetheless, we had uh, very solid financial results as a company just uh, just shy of about $3 billion. We are publicly traded through Lincoln. So if there's ever an interest in taking a look at any of our financial information, that can be found certainly on the internet, or uh, if you choose, you can listen to any kinds of earnings calls and such that we may have. So when we look at our wholesale channel, what do, what do we do? What do we bring? How do we look at this? Well, part of that is being the fact that we are a U.S.-based manufacturer. So when you're, when you're buying product from the Harris Products Group, 
it's all manufactured here in the U.S. So your brazing alloys, your equipment, your regulators, et cetera, are all made here in the U.S. Along with that, we have a, a broad portfolio range. And I'm going to go through that quickly, but I think more importantly is our sales and technical support. As we're talking about this, this brazing of, of aluminum, keep in mind that we have manufacturer's reps, plus we have direct field salespeople that we are able to help you and train you if you're interested in doing that. So whether you're a wholesaler, a contractor, um, just an interested party, if you'd like to have some type of training on, uh, on brazing applications, we can do that. And in fact, we even have a NATE certified soldering and brazing course that is offered which is a three-hour continuing education course where it's an hour and a half of classroom time and an hour and a half of on the torch brazing uh, different types of products. So I'd like to throw that out there as, uh, as something to consider as well. So just from a product standpoint, um, many of these things you're going to be familiar with. Our, our typical product is FOSS coppers, and I know everybody in the uh, refrigeration business and HVAC business knows this probably for our 15%. Um, solders and fluxes also then, as we talked about a little more in the, uh, in the plumbing space. But you do see Stay Bright and Stay Bright 8 uh, also in the HVAC space from a typical solder perspective. And then uh, when we look at equipment, we've got a very uh, diverse product line here as well. So you can see the, uh, the oxy fuel sets as well as, well as some of the, uh, the air fuel and then uh, MAP and propane gases as well. So with that, I'm gonna shift gears into kind of the heart of the presentation. And with that, we're gonna have a poll question because I'm curious, please answer yes or no if you have experience brazing aluminum. So if we could uh, if we could just answer that question, uh, you guys, it's open to do that. Um, I'd be interested in knowing your experience in uh, in this area. Okay, so that poll question is launched, and it looks like let me give them a few more seconds. So majority have voted. So I'm gonna have, go ahead and close that, and I'll read the results for you. So 42% said yes, and 59% said no. Back to you. Okay. All right. So some of you have some experience in this, and there's going to be some, uh, some newbies here. So really, how did all this come about? When did, uh, when did this occur in, uh, from a historical perspective? So as we look at this, copper had always been really the product of choice uh, in the manufacture of HVAC and refrigeration systems. So I kind of think through why, what, where, when, and how, all those types of questions that all this begin to change. Well, if we dial it back a few years in 2011, copper prices had increased dramatically, and at that time, an all-time high, which if we look today, <laughs> maybe uh, maybe it looks more attractive given the fact of the, uh, the roller coaster ride we're on with uh, with different types of commodities. So the, the OEMs or the original equipment manufacturers, they started to think about, hey, what kind of alternative products or materials could we use that could replace copper? The intent was to try to keep the cost of the units down. So from a, from a perspective in the marketplace, there weren't gonna be huge price increases to, uh, to the wholesaler or to the, uh, the contractors as well and the dealers. So they settled in on aluminum because it was the most cost effective and from a material perspective, it was gonna be able to reduce uh, overall costs. The challenge with it, however, was that aluminum has a very narrow range of the heat tolerance. And we're gonna get into that here in a little bit compared to copper. And it's also very susceptible to corrosion. So you've got a couple of dynamics here. And then, uh, Really, when we focus on this and we talk through this presentation, I want to focus the rest of our time on the applications, a little bit on the alloys, and then, as I mentioned earlier, some videos that we have that you're going to be able to see the process and how it all takes place. So as we talk about this, again, we're going to look at the application for aluminum, the composition of those alloys the melting ranges, and some of the brazing techniques. 
And as you can see in the diagrams or the pictures there above, you're going to see some of those aluminum bends that are uh, prevalent now in the uh, in the space. And some of those, by the way, which uh, we actually manufacture here in our factory for some of the OEMs. So as we look at this and we think about it, typical applications that we encounter for aluminum, pretty wide ranging, residential and commercial HVAC, just general coil repair and some automotive applications, which probably the majority of you uh, on the call aren't necessarily involved in, but we do see some of that. And the alloy that we're gonna focus our time on today is a 7822 zinc aluminum alloy. So as you can see this here, when you look at the number designation, 7822 indicates the amount of zinc and aluminum from a content perspective. So in this alloy, 78% is zinc and 22% is aluminum. The second piece of this is when you look at the solidus and liquidus points of aluminum, again, it has a 100 degree melting range. When you look at something like a, a FOSS copper, those melting ranges typically are much wider than that. And as a result, that's why this, when you're looking at aluminum and the temperature that it takes to melt the product at, at 900 degrees, you're starting almost to get to the melting temperature of the aluminum alloy or the base alloy itself. So that's the, the trickiness in this. So the operators, it says um, here, 100, melting, 100 degrees for melting range, and it really makes it at that point very easy to fill holes and cracks. There are some other uh, products that we make in aluminum. As an example, we have a 98.2 zinc aluminum combination, but in that particular one, it only has a 15 degree melting range. So that's why we really encourage from a repair perspective that this is the, uh, the alloy of choice. Now this particular product is also flux cord with a non-corrosive flux. So the cord is designed to release the flux only after sufficient preheating. So both the flux and the alloy will flow at the right time into the capillary. So noted here again, no flux required. Everything is uh, really contained within the, uh, within the alloy itself or within the, the, uh, the stick of product. So one of the, uh, the most important things here is the cleaning process. And I know that uh, oftentimes when people think about cleaning, you know, what does that really mean? And is it, is it a particularly important detail? Uh, they kind of wrestle with these things. But really when you're looking at aluminum, it's particularly critical. So when we do that, the first step is to make sure that you pull a vacuum in your system so there's no oils left. Okay, so um, then the next step behind that, we really want to have all of the grease and dirt to be wiped off and chemically cleaned if necessary. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the problems with aluminum is it, it can develop a lot of oxides. So with that, we recommend that you clean the aluminum with a stainless steel brush to remove any of those oxides that are on that base metal. This brush, by the way, for those who maybe are techs or you have technicians in the field, really should only be used on aluminum. It's not something that you should be using on, uh, on copper and then using on aluminum and then maybe using on a stainless or something. It should just be dedicated to the use on the aluminum only. If you tend not to do that, you're going to have some contamination. And with that contamination, you could jeopardize the integrity of that joint. Um, and then if that happens, if you have failures, you may have callbacks, you may have uh, some dissatisfied customers. So uh, you want to, again, make sure that from a cleaning perspective that you follow this, these steps as recommended. So here we have another poll question. So there's 59% of you that said you have done some brazing. So if that's the case, have you braced aluminum? If you have braced it, have you used this cleaning process? All right, so I went ahead and launched that question. And if everybody could just please submit your response, yes or no, that would be great. Then I'll read those aloud in just a moment. 
going to give everybody a few more seconds to submit their vote. All right, so it looks like majority of voters. I'll go ahead and close that and share the results. And it looks like 39% said yes and 60% said no. Back to you. Maybe uh, maybe we can have a phone call with the sixty percent, and we can talk about uh, how you uh, how you actually cleaned it. <laughs> so, anyway, um, again, from a from a clinic cleaning perspective, that's what we do recommend, and I would encourage you to uh, give give strong consideration to that. <clears throat> so, as I talked about, we have a video. And I'm going to show you here that uh, just in a minute here, I'll, I'll uh, show the video to you. But prior to showing you this brazing process, this aluminum tube was cleaned with a stainless brush, as we talked about. We are going to be using one of our hand torches. So this is not going to be a, uh, an acetylene type torch um, or, any, or an oxyfuel or air fuel torch. This is just going to simply be one of our hand torches and we're going to be using a, a map pro fuel on the top of that. We did this in our brazing lab upstairs, so it makes it uh, made it really easy to do that. And as you look at this, pay uh, special attention to move the torch continuously in a feathering technique to really get that base metal up to uh, temperature. And then when the alloy is flu flowed, just move the torch away completely from the base metal. And as you see this and as you watch this video, it's a very short time. The torch is going to be lit, and by the time it's extinguished, it's going to be less than 15 seconds to get the aluminum up to the brazing temperature. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and show this video, and you guys can take a look at this. So it's not long, so uh, hold on to the edge of your seat here. So as I said, you can see that this happens very quickly. Now, just think if you were doing that with copper. Um, copper takes a, a much longer time for the preheat. Uh, I also want to draw attention, and I think most people on the call probably already know this, but we need to be uh, cautious and careful that we're always heating the base metal. Um, sometimes I see people where they uh, put the torch on the alloy itself and try to heat that and try to fill a hole or do some type of joint with that, and obviously that's uh, that's not going to be effective. So you have to be uh, really focused on hitting that base metal product to make sure that the pro the uh, the alloy flows. So another poll question: uh, If you have brazed aluminum, have you experienced overheating or blowing a bigger hole in the part? All right, so I went ahead and launched that, and I'll give everybody just a few seconds to answer yes or no. And just a few more seconds. All right, so majority voted. I'll go ahead and close it out, and I'll share those results. And it looks like 77% said yes, and 22% said no. Okay, so it looks like uh, the overheating uh, has won. And again, it's, it's not uncommon, right? Because as most of us, again, are used to brazing a, a copper joint in particular, longer time to heat, we're thinking, hey, this is a metal, I've got to really heat it up. And as you can see, it happens in uh, really in a matter of seconds as opposed to maybe a minute or more to heat up copper. So in this particular video that I'm going to show, uh, you can see that we have the tube now in a, uh, instead of just laying on a, uh, on a table, which is rather unlikely, uh, we have it in a, uh, in a vertical position so you get a better idea of what's happening here. So really, the, the process is going to be the same. You're going to heat the base metal, kind of moving the torch back and forth. 
uh, feathering it, if you will, and then really just allow the gravity to take advantage and using that in your, your vertical repair. So I want to mention, too, that when uh, using the Alux core or the aluminum, uh, or excuse me, the Lux core on aluminum to copper repair, the area should, uh, should be painted or sealed to prevent any type of corrosion afterwards. So let me take, have you take a look at this. So in this video, that repair even took less time. It was, uh, it was done in 10 seconds. So the previous one from, uh, from light to completion was about 15. This one from lighting the torch to completion was about 10 seconds. So again, very, very, uh, very short heating times. So just to kind of bring all this uh, together this evening, a Luxcore, the 7822, this is kind of an important note here, can be used for aluminum to aluminum and aluminum to copper applications. So it's just not completely restricted to aluminum. And then the composition is a 78% zinc, 22% aluminum. Recall that the melting temperature is 800 degrees on the solidus side, 900 on the liquidus side. So the melting range, the plastic range you may hear it called, is about 100 degrees. And then the brazing process and the heating technique for aluminum to copper joints and aluminum repairs. So you were able to see a couple of videos on that. And uh, one thing I, I would throw out here too is, and I mentioned this earlier, that if you're struggling with this and you would like to have uh, some actually uh, actual field training. Uh, we do have people in the field that uh, we would be happy to extend to you. We recently just did a, uh, a large training in Columbus, Ohio, where we trained uh, 50 technicians over, oh, I guess it was about a, a three-week period. So we cycled through every couple of days uh, doing a training. So if you, if you have a business, if you uh, are an HVAC or refrigeration, company and you would like to have that option out there, we would certainly uh, welcome to uh, or extend to you a, uh, any of our uh, groups to come out and do that training for you. We would bring everything that would be needed. Uh, we've got uh, the aluminum coupons to allow people to experiment with that as well as any of the types of torches. So I do have a little quiz here um, and I know I'm not expecting anyone to necessarily uh, respond like we've done with the poll questions, but we are going to go through this and just kind of test your knowledge a little bit, and then uh, we'll answer each one of those questions as we go. So number one, and this is multiple choice, what alloys can be brazed with a Lux core? So A is aluminum to steel, B, aluminum to copper, C, aluminum to aluminum, and D, copper to copper. So if you recall here, just a couple slides back, and I'll go back here, is it can be aluminum to aluminum and aluminum to copper applications. So anybody that said aluminum to copper, which was B, and aluminum to aluminum on C, you were correct. So number two, true or false, when heating aluminum for repair, it is not necessary to bring the metal up to temperature. You can just use the torch to melt the alloy. But we had just talked about that a minute ago. That would be false. The alloy does need to be melted with the metal being up to temperature first. Number three. Aluminum should be cleaned with a soft stainless brush used exclusively for aluminum applications. So again, when we went back, I'm going to refer back here real quickly to that cleaning process. We talked specifically about the fact that aluminum has oxides and that we need to use a stainless brush to remove that metal. And I know in the poll question, there were about 60% of the folks 
that said that they had not done that. So again, that would be uh, a focus of that because if you're not using that brush or you're not using that cleaning procedure, you could possibly uh, be jeopardizing your joint. And uh, again, that we may have failures or uh, a need for callbacks. So number four, the heating technique for aluminum repairs involves moving the torch continuously. So that answer is true. You could see that when we looked at the videos there, the alloy, or excuse me, the base metal of the aluminum heats very, very quickly. If you, kept, if you keep it on one spot, you're likely going to burn or blow a bigger hole. And now you have a much tougher type repair, if you will, or it may have actually been so big that the repair is not even possible. And now you're going to have to look at possible replacements. So with that, um, I know this is about 30 minutes, so just uh, I'll take questions and, and uh, hopefully have answers for you now if there's any questions out there. And uh, I'll turn that back to uh, to Jordan for the questions. Yeah, thank you so much. We've got some really good questions for you to, or to answer. Uh, let's see. We've got, I tried, to repair, I tried to repair a leak in an aluminum condenser coil with that success. Did the PoE oil in the coil prevent the alloy from working? It can, yes. So if you don't if you don't evacuate all the oils out of there, uh, it could prevent that from uh, from taking, so to speak. Uh, when you look at today in a lot of in a lot of systems, uh, they have a, they obviously have different types of oils that are in them. The old oils, the old oils used to be used in refrigeration systems, as an example, were mineral oils, and they were very, very forgiving. But we have found that uh, oils that are used in those systems today are, are less forgiving. So if uh, systems aren't cleaned properly, then they, you can run into some trouble with that. So why do copper to aluminum bridge joints need to be sealed when completed? Um, it's just just from a uh, from a standpoint of uh, preventing any kinds of uh, any kind of corrosion or any types of oxides that may form there. Do you need nitrogen to braze? I have a whole presentation on nitrogen <laughs> on, <laughs> on nitrogen purging. Uh, that that's a big yes. Um, you know, just a minute ago when the question was asked about the uh, the oils. Uh, one of the things that really was overlooked, and that has been nitrogen purging, and I know there's been people that just kind of a skip step, but it's not really that difficult to do. Um, obviously, you need to, uh, when you're flowing it, it's just a couple PSI. It's not necessarily, you're not trying to blow out the whole system. Um, but yes, it really, when you're, we would encourage anyone to to purge their systems and have a nitrogen purge going. And really, when you think about it, too, whether it's aluminum or whether it's copper, it's per, you'll just when you see even when you see oxidations on the outside of a, of a pipe, those oxidations occur inside the pipe. And if you're not flowing that nitrogen, that those oxides that are going to be built up, uh, those oils become almost like scrubbing agents and those particles will drop off and drop into the system and it will shorten the life cycle of uh of whatever unit that's on. Uh, is it recommended to put put the system on a? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a flood of questions coming in, and it's ruining my uh, my script. Um, what type of cleaning chemical would you recommend to uh, weld? Uh, if we were interested in a good training class, how would we go about registering or seeing where a class is located? So if you're interested in a, in a class, um, the best thing to do, and I thought we were going to have uh, my email address on here on the end, but uh, the best way would be to reach out to me, um, indicate how many people, the locations uh, that uh, or where you're located, the timing of, of that, and then um, if you, a couple of things. 
if you're within a few hour drive of, uh, of Cincinnati, Ohio, or, or I would say, so if you think of Cincinnati, um, Columbus, Dayton, Cleveland, Lexington, uh, Louisville, Indianapolis, uh, maybe even Pittsburgh, which is about four hours. We'd love to have you in our Braze Lab here in Cincinnati. Uh, otherwise, uh, you can just email me. Again, tell me the uh, number of folks that you would like to have included in your training, uh, the location, and, uh, and some dates, and then I can uh, assign the appropriate people to come out and uh, conduct that training. That's great. That's a huge help. Well, tell me, what's the best way to avoid getting a bigger hole in a tube or coil? Yeah, so back off the, the torch the, itself, right? You want to back the torch off. And I don't mean, I'm not saying back the heat off, back the torch away from the tube so that you are not right on top of it. And you want to make sure that you're feathering that heat back and forth. So if you keep that heat in one constant point, think of this. Remember when we were all kids and we would take a magnifying glass and refract the sun onto a sheet of paper. And that was a point where that sun's refracting right onto that, that paper and it burns, right? Well, if you're using, if you do that same technique with a torch and point it right to the, where the hole is, that, or you're, that you're trying to fill, or you're trying to brace the joint in that capillary, um, you're going to have the same problem. So that way you need to feather that heat back and forth. And you can see that heating process 10 to 15 seconds, and that base metal is up to temperature to begin to apply that aluminum. Okay. So tell me, do you have any guidance on when to repair versus when to replace a coil? Um, that's probably going to be a question maybe that, that uh, would be directed, I think, to an OEM. Um, they probably have some recommendations that they would make on that. Uh, I don't, I haven't personally experienced when and when not to. So I would, uh, I'd rather, I'd rather pass that back to the OEMs and, and uh, you know, whether it's Ream or Train or Root or whoever, and maybe uh, inquire that, have that question inquired within them. Oh, we can definitely defer that question. So tell me, what is the maximum pressure the, the joint repair can handle? Um, in aluminum, most of the systems are probably Probably about 700 PSI. Okay. Uh, well, tell me the technique you described, does it also work for micro channel repair? Uh, yeah, I would say that, I mean, any, in, you know, we, when we look at it, whether it's, it, whether any, it's any one of our products, we recommend the, the, the movement of the torch back and forth. Okay. Uh, I apologize for some of this. Our, our question that you already answered, but I'm uh, uh, I'm just getting them as they come in. Uh, do you recommend yep. using a nitrogen uh, purge while brazing aluminum? I think you already talked about that. I just want to confirm. Yeah, any any time whether you're whether it's aluminum or or copper, uh, we always recommend nitrogen purge. Okay. Uh, can you talk about cleaning chemicals after doing brazing? We've got a couple questions like that, and rather than ask each of them individually, maybe you can talk about that broadly. Um, what type of cleaning chemicals would you recommend after you're done with the braze? Um, I was kind of pause on chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lots of times what we actually see is uh, people might use a little bit of, um, instead of a, an actual chemical, they may just use some of their, uh, like sandpaper, or like their, uh, like a 7447 hand pad or something like that, just to uh, to brush up or to kind of clean off that joint. That's okay. We can definitely defer this question for another time. Um, here's another one. With the solder having such a low melting point, is there more potential for leaks with aluminum coils versus copper coils? Uh, also, what are the safe? Yeah, I'm pretty sure you actually just talked about that. So let's stick with the first question. 
we haven't we haven't seen that to be the case. Um, no, it's uh, if again if a, if a joint is braced properly, we don't we don't see that that's going to have a a, a leak before instead of copper. Uh, here's a rather specific question: Do the aluminum tube? Do you put the aluminum tube into the copper tube, or the copper tube into the aluminum tube for a joint? I don't know the answer to that. Okay, well, we can definitely defer. Um, yeah. Uh, no problem at all. Uh, let's see. Uh, when brazing aluminum to copper, how can you get both metals uh, to heat up, uh, up to heat? Aluminum is lower heat, copper the higher heat. I would start with the copper heat first and get that up to your temperature and then move to aluminum. Um, you, if you think of, of copper, it's probably going to take, you know, a minute or so to, to get up to heat. So start with that. And as, uh, as that begins up to, coming up to temperature, uh, copper is a, a good conductor of heat as it is. So as you're, as you're bringing the, uh, the joints together, um, if you're heating that and then you quickly move over to that aluminum, uh, that heating process would be the most effective. Um, I'm not sure if this falls under chemicals or not. And if it is, we can totally defer it. Uh, but what do you paint the aluminum and copper joints with? I don't, I don't have a paint recommendation. Okay, that's fine. We can definitely uh, defer that. Uh, let's see. Give me one second. I apologize. I'm going through some of the uh, going through some of the questions, trying to find one I was looking for before. Um, uh, do you use acetylene or oxyacetylene uh, when you in in the second video you use? We're using acetylene or oxyacetylene. Oh, in the second video we were using um, a hand torch and map gas. Ah, uh, okay. So if you think of um, just a trigger torch on top of a can of, uh, of MAP, uh, that was what we had used in, in the lab scenario. Would you consider MAP the best heat to use? I'm sorry, Jordan, you broke up there. I'm sorry, would you consider MAP heat the best heat to use? I don't know that it's necessarily the, the best heat to use um, from a convenience perspective. Um, you know, it, it's it's very easy, but you can certainly use um, any type of other other torches. If you wanted to use a different oxyacetylene torch or a, a, an aerocetylene torch other than just, uh, or excuse me, an oxy fuel torch, you could use any of those. Um, there's no limitation to that. You just have to be careful with the heat. Um, even a uh, even a, uh, a hand torch on top of a uh, can of map gas is about twelve thousand BTU, so it's it's pretty hot. Uh, what would the maximum hole size be to attempt to braze? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to defer on that one. Uh, okay. The ones we had here, the ones we have here, as you can see in the videos, they were. They were fairly small. This were probably maybe probably a quarter, a quarter inch. Um, I'm sure that a, a manufacturer, uh, they probably have some recommendations on repair versus replace and on what size uh, hole that would be. Okay, not a problem at all. Thanks everyone for joining this evening. I, I do appreciate it. And uh, hopefully this was beneficial for you.